Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, minimum cost to make at least one valid path in a grid. And before we get into this problem, I want to briefly mention that today's problem is actually very, very similar to one that we've solved about two months ago. It's uh, this hey. one here. And I would say it's like almost exactly the same in terms of at least like the solution. And so I'll only be covering one solution for today's problem because the other one I think I covered pretty well in this problem and several other problems. But anyways, so the solution I'm going to be mainly explaining in this one is going to be the most optimal one, at least in terms of big O. I think it's debatable on whether this one is necessarily more optimal than like Dijkstra's algorithm for uh, this problem. But let's just get into the problem now. The idea is that we're given a grid, but the grid is a little bit different than what we're used to. This time, each of the cells just tells us a direction. It could either be to the right, to the left, up, or down. So the way this is going to be given to us is if the arrow means to the right, we're going to have a 1 there. If it means uh, to the left, I think we're going to have a 2. If it were to mean down, I think we'd have 3, and up would be 4. Now, the idea behind the problem is that we start at the top left, and we want to reach the bottom right position. If there was a path that we could just follow somehow and land at the bottom right position, that'd be great. But if there is not a path, and for each of these arrows, we can only move in the direction that the arrow points. And this arrow happens to take us out of bounds. That doesn't mean we can actually go out of bounds. So right now there is not a direct path here, but we could change the direction of some of these arrows if we want to. So if I choose to change the direction of this one and I don't make it go up or to the left, I make it go down, that was a cost of one. But now I'm here and I could go down one more time and that'd be another cost of one. And right now, once again, a cost of one. So there's guaranteed to be a path that leads us here. I mean, it's guaranteed because we can literally change the direction of the arrows. But what's not guaranteed is the cost. Our goal is to minimize the cost. So even though the problem specifically says we are not looking necessarily for the shortest path, in a sense, we technically are. We're just trying to look for the shortest cost or the smallest cost. And so if we can set that up as a graph problem, you can then use the very famous uh, Dijkstra's uh, shortest path algorithm to solve this pretty efficiently. And I've done so many variations of Dijkstra's and the problem that I mentioned earlier, I think will give you a pretty textbook way of how to implement a Dijkstra's algorithm for this problem, if you're interested in that. But the more interesting algorithm that I'm going to implement for you is actually a pretty simple BFS. It's called the 01 BFS, and that's what we also implemented in the other problem I was talking about, leak code 2290, if you want to look that up. I'll briefly explain the intuition and then we'll get into the implementation. The implementation is actually pretty easy, at least if you're familiar with like BFS. The idea is similar to the regular BFS algorithm, which is a greedy algorithm in some ways, at least if you use it for like the shortest path. Now with this problem, it's not exactly set up in that same way, but if you think about the grid that we're given, we're here. Now we have kind of four choices because we could follow the direction of the arrow, and that's gonna take us here. That has a cost of zero. So ideally, we should start with that first. We should try to just follow the arrows before we try to change them, because changing them is gonna cost more. So we would try to do the cheaper way, the greedy way first. Now, for this spot, we did have a few other choices. We could have gone up or to the left. Those don't really count since they take us out of bounds, but we had the other choice of going directly down that would have been a cost of plus one. So ideally, we tried that later. And so this isn't that different from the Dijkstra's setup, the shortest path algorithm. And in some ways, you could use this like intuition to implement a more brute force solution to this problem. But there actually is another way. The idea is just to do it like a regular BFS, except we have two ends to the queue, and we're going to be using both ends. So this is my queue uh, data structure. So what I would do is I would first have this position on my queue. So let's just call it a zero, zero. And this drawing is probably going to get messy. So I'll just make the queue a little bit bigger from the start. So I'm going to put this zero, zero towards the middle. But let's assume we're adding on the right side. So now we pop from the queue, the first element. And like I said, there's kind of four choices, but there's only two real choices that we could go to. We have the neighbor to the right, directly to the right. 
and that is the coordinate zero one. So I'm going to add that to the left side of my queue. Following the arrow, I'm going to add that to the left side. But all the others, well, right now there's only a single one, which is directly below. That's one zero. And I'm going to add that to the right side of my queue. The thing I haven't drawn with each of these is the cost associated with each one. And I'll just put that like in purple just to make it obvious. This one was zero. This one was also zero, but this one was one. And we got rid of this. But now when we pop from the queue, once again, we're going to pop the leftmost. So it should always be the smallest cost that is available to us in our queue. Because if we were popping this guy and now it has a neighbor, that maybe is going to have a cost of zero. That would be the direction that we're following, but maybe that direction will take us out of bounds or something. So maybe now it doesn't have any neighbors that have a cost of zero, but all the other neighbors are going to have a cost of exactly one more than that. And then thus they're going to be added to the right side. So basically all of the costs of these are going to be monotonically increasing. And so I'll try to do a dry run through the rest of this. I think what's going to happen here is we're just going to end up uh, popping uh, this guy until we kind of make some hops and then eventually get to over here. And at that point, I think our queue is just going to get very, very messy. So I won't go through the entire dry run here, but at some point you can imagine like maybe we're over here. And so this cell, I believe, is uh, two, three. And the cost associated to get there was two because we had to go down twice. And so now at this point, our queue would not have anything less than a two because we've gone through everything in the grid. We've gone through all of these. Those took a cost of one. All of these took a minimum cost of two. All of these took a minimum cost of three. I had it backwards. Sorry, this should have started at zero, then this one, and then this two. And so it's possible that these could actually be on the queue right now. That's perfectly fine, but all of their costs are going to be one more than this one. So if they were on the queue, suppose like three zero is on the queue, it's going to have a cost associated with it of three. So it's going to be on the right side. And then we're going to end up popping uh, this one first, and then we'll find that this was the first position or this was the first time we saw this. So that must be the shortest uh, cost, shortest path, smallest cost, whatever you want to say. So the whole idea behind this algorithm is that we have a queue and we will either decide to add to the left side of the queue or to the right side of the queue, depending on some condition. I think that's why it's called zero one uh, BFS. Now the rest of the implementation details, I think I'll explain in the actual code, because I think implementing this one is a little bit harder than the one I mentioned earlier, which was two, two, nine, zero. So let's get into that. So the first thing I do is just start with some boilerplate. We get the dimensions of our grid and we get that mapping. One will map to this direction. So this is the row column delta. And so each of them will have a certain direction associated with them. Then for the BFS, I set up my queue like this and I'm going to have a pair of three elements, zero, zero, zero. And I think you actually don't need all three. We could just get the coordinates if we wanted to, but just to make things easier, I like to put a cost associated with each of these as well. For this one, we're actually going to need a hash map as well. I'll try to explain that in just a second. I'll make it a default dict, but I think that's unnecessary. So I'll actually just make it a regular dictionary for now. And so now this is the BFS part of the code. While the queue is non-empty, we are going to pop from the left side of the queue. That's pretty uh, standard. So then we will have the row, the column, and the cost associated with reaching the current node. By the way, I guess we could initialize our hash wrap like this, zero mapping to zero, or actually it's gonna be the coordinates. So zero, zero mapping to that. So just to make this clear. Now with my BFS, I like to do things a pretty cookie cutter way. So the first thing I like to check is if we've reached the target position. So if this is equal to uh, rows minus one and columns minus one, if that's the case, then we are at the target position. This is the cost associated with that position. So we can just return it. Now, after that, there are probably multiple ways to code this up. This is the way I'm going to do it. We want to go through all four of the directions of the current position. That's a pretty standard thing to do with BFS. I'm going to do that like this for D in direction, but this is a direction one through four. So using that, we can get the neighboring uh, position. First, we're going to get the direction. So uh, we could do that like this direction of D that will give us 
uh, the pairing here, which I'm going to unpack like this, dr, dc. And then using that, we can get the new row and the new column or the neighbor row, neighbor column, whatever you want to call it. So we can do the current row plus dr, the current column plus dc. So we're looking at all four of the neighbors. There's a couple things. One is mainly just the out of bounds check. So we could do that like this. If the new uh, row is less than zero or the new column is less than zero or the new row is equal to the number of rows or uh, this, then we have gone out of bounds, in which case we can just continue to the next iteration of the loop. The other thing I want to mention, because this is kind of the most important part of the algorithm, is we're going to do something like this. We're going to do Q dot append to it, the neighbor row, neighbor column, and the new cost associated with it. Let's call that the neighbor cost. So we want to do this, but we also want to do this, append left. We only want to append the neighbor that our current direction is actually going. So you could say that is determined by the current direction, and we're going through all four neighbors, but the direction is stored here. So D, is it equal to the grid at the current position, row, column? If the direction matches the cell that we came from, then in that case, we want to do this append left. Otherwise, we want to do the part at the bottom, append it to the right side. Now, we still have to get these values. Well, we already have the neighbor row and neighbor column, but we still have to get the new cost associated with it, which is actually the easiest thing to get. In this case, the cost will stay the same because we're just following the arrow. In this case, the cost will go up by one. So this is correct. Now I'm not going to write it this way because we're actually going to need that cost in just a second. So I'm going to put that neighbor cost over here. So neighbor cost is either going to be equal to the original cost if direction is equal to this. Otherwise, we will have to increment it by one. It'll be cost plus one. So this is the case where that was just the cost. And the else case is where the cost was added one. Now, this probably looks almost done to you, and that's because it is. But there's one thing that we're forgetting. Where am I actually going to use that neighbor cost? And why did I declare this hash map up here? Well, the hash map serves two purposes. One, we don't want to visit the same position twice. We don't want to end up adding multiple values to the queue. So usually I can put that here. I could do something like... Um, if the neighbor row, neighbor column is in the minimum cost, then we could skip it. But there actually is a catch with this problem. I'll try to create a very brief example of it. Um, I'm just going to use some kind of random uh, positions. These are all zeros right now. But imagine a case like this. We start at the top left and the arrow is going to the right. So we could reach this position with a total cost of zero. But if we go down, to reach that position, it's a total cost of one because we have to change the arrow to now point down. But what if there's still another path? Like right now, we would say our queue will look something like this. It'll have a zero, zero at the left, and then we'll add one, zero at the right, which has a cost of one. But it's possible that we could pop this, get here, and then follow the arrow to here, here, and then get down, and then start moving to the left. And we could theoretically reach this position with a total cost of zero. So just because we've added something to the queue doesn't mean that we finalize the minimal cost for reaching that position. So the queue is not kind of the final source of truth. So to uh, correct that, we're going to do a couple things. Instead of checking that the position's already been visited, we're going to check that the cost is indeed minimal, meaning that the new cost that we've calculated right now must be greater than or equal to the minimum cost that we've stored for uh, the neighboring position. So we would do something like this, neighbor row, neighbor column, but then we might get an index out of bounds error, and I don't want to have to deal with that. We could use a default dict, but then that'll return a default value of zero. So the way I'm handling that is by doing this dot get, and then um, we can tell it to return a default value of infinity if this key does not exist. So we're saying that initially the minimal cost for all the positions that we haven't set is infinity because then this will always uh, be false. And then we'll end up actually like calculating the cost. And so after that, the only thing left to do is once we've actually computed that cost, we can store it somewhere either before or after this if else statement. So min cost of row 
uh, neighbor column is going to be the new cost. That was a lot of like minor details to kind of focus on. Overall, I think this code is pretty comparable to like a Dijkstra's implementation. I think it's a little bit more complicated, but I think that's kind of what makes it worth doing. And hopefully you learned something from here. Let's uh, run this code. And I think I forgot an or statement. So really sorry about that. Hopefully the rest of this is correct. And another minor mistake, I think, was just the way I initialized my queue. So I should have passed in a list which contains a single tuple. And now you can see that the code works and it is pretty efficient. If you found this helpful, check out neatcode.io and maybe check out that other video I was talking about as well.